Hey guys, welcome to Total Health Live with Dr. Sedano. I am Dr. Sedano and I am absolutely thrilled that you're here today. We've got a phenomenal topic that I tell you affects so many of us, whether you're an adult or a child, and that is ADD or ADHD. So we're going to be getting diving deep into this today, talking a lot about what it's about and practical things that you could do at home to, to finally solve and heal this. And this is actually going to be a two-part series, so we're going to need you to time chime in for the second part, which will probably be around the same time and we're going to wrap it up with some more solutions for you but I'm thrilled you're here and if you guys if you're here for the first time I'm going to be checking my phone to make sure that I see any questions that you might have so go ahead and chime in let me know where you're from let me you know comments and guys if you like what we're talking about today go ahead and and just hit the like button hit the heart button share it out because this is information that I guarantee is going to be super super impactful that you're going to want your friends to know about. So let me turn my volume off here and I'll see you guys as you come on. Anyway, once again, thanks for being here. The topic today is the top strategies that you can do to finally heal ADD. And like I said, this is something that affects so many of us. I mean, who doesn't want to do the best you can at work, to have your children perform the best they can, to have your children be you know, active in school and participate in? Really, it comes down to self-esteem, guys. Who wants their self-esteem of their child to be sky high? Hit yes if you feel that way, and we all should, and we all do. But it also comes to us. I tell you, I see so many parents come in my office that when they're sitting there with their kids in my consultation, they'll look at me and say, hey, uh, he gets this from me. I know, I got this too. And the dad will chime in, or the mom will say they have issues. And it really is devastating because you can't focus on anything. You can't get things done. You can't be as successful as you want to be in life, or your children as they be in life. Hey, Ken, welcome on. Glad you're here, brother. So um, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and write them in the comment bar there. We'll see if we can get them answered for you today on the show. Other than that, I will get them answered during the week. But anyway, this is something that's definitely affected my family and my life. Here's my family right here. I'm this goofy-looking guy in the top there. Anyway, I tell you what, when I was a kid, and I'm, I just had my 52nd birthday last week, and so... This wasn't even really talked about when I was growing up, but I guarantee you I would have been labeled ADD because I fidgeted, I moved, you know, I was the kid with the feet going under the table that couldn't sit still, you know, I was the one that you're trying to do your homework and it's like, whoop, squirrel, what's that? Shiny object? And I was just off to the races. I couldn't stay focused. I couldn't stay on task. And a lot of times I do that now. I could be reading a book. I tend to read a lot of research type things. And I'll go through a paragraph or so, and I'll look back and go, what did I just read? I, I zoned out for a moment there. I wasn't paying attention, or something caught my eye. And next thing you know, it's squirrel, and I'm not following. But, you know, so I've had this myself, too. My children have had, and I don't like to put labels on things, but my children have struggled with issues like this also. My son is your typical daredevil type, so if I was to say he's the, the hyper type, and he's the one that's, you know, he's a big rock climber now. He loves climbing and just scares the you-know-what out of me because he's, he's bouldering and he's climbing up 25, 30 feet and landing on this mat about this thick. Or he's, you know, hopefully sometimes roped in and doing these high rope things. But he's the type that I remember one time he was riding down a hill on one of those rip sticks, one of those kind of skateboards that kind of goes like this so when you're moving your hips you can get it to go faster. And he's flying down a hill. And when he gets back up top, I'm just yelling at him, what are you doing? You're crazy. You had no helmet on. You're going down this hill. The cars could have pulled out, and, and he would have been splattered. So he is definitely the daredevil type, the type that likes to interrupt and so on. And Andre, if you're watching this, I'm not trying to, to throw you under the bus, but it, it, it's for, for learning purposes, son. And, and then I got a daughter who, who, who has little bouts of anxiety. And the anxiety is also something that we see relating a lot to ADD. And so my children have experienced this too. This is definitely in my life. And if it's experiencing in your life, you, you, you definitely want to make sure that you're tuned into this. Like I said, watch for the second part, but also to share it, like it, get it out to more people. Because I guarantee you have a lot of friends who would love to know this information. So 
Next thing, when it comes to ADD, it totally has a way of destroying your life. 33% of the people with ADD never finish high school. A third of our society with this problem don't actually get through. One of the most basic things we can do is graduate high school. So how does that then affect or impact them for, for college or going on with life and being able to, to be successful if you're not even getting through high school? What does that do to their self-esteem? 52% will abuse drugs or alcohol. You know, and one of the things that we're going to be talking about today is some of the natural things you can do, some of the natural remedies, because the last thing you want to do, and I tell this to all the patients who come in for consultations, is that the last thing you want to do is get on a medication for this because it becomes a gateway to another medication. And the last thing you want is a child thinking that they're incomplete or can't make it or somehow defective unless they have this pill. And with this pill, then they can do things. But without the pill, they're, somehow God didn't make them complete and whole. And that's probably one of the worst things you could do for a child is have them think they need a pill to be able to function in life. So it leads to abuse of alcohol, increases the risk of obesity. You know, you might get a lot of children that start to binge eat. And because they're bored or frustrated, we start to eat because we want to be comfortable. We see increased risk of divorce and separation three to five times. Once again, you get people who are dissatisfied, unhappy, you know, restless. They just start to look elsewhere. Separation, auto accidents. I mean, obviously, if somebody's not focusing in life, they're not going to be focusing on the road. Or like I said, it might be squirrel or, or shiny object. Next thing you know, you're in an accident. And so we see a lot more accidents, 33% more ER visits. Depression. Well, once again, if you're not making it, if you can't focus and if you can't be, you know, good. Hey, see a couple more of my friends on the line here. Scott, glad you're here. And Justin, good to see you, cuz. So depression is high. Job failures are high because, once again, you're not being able to focus on your job. You start to, to miss job situations. I was talking to a patient yesterday who told me he completely missed a conference call with a VP of a major company in this country. I won't say what it is, but one of the top companies in this country, he completely missed a conference call. And he comes in, he's like, how could I do that? How could I miss this call? Do you know how bad that is? He goes, fortunately, as I was able to reschedule, but this guy wasn't happy. So job failures and incarceration. Who would have ever thought, guys, that higher rates of ADD can lead to incarceration, but it does. So moving on. We see that 6.4 uh, 6 million children are diagnosed with this. And what really makes this dangerous is this is 6.4 million children who are going to potentially end up on dangerous psychotropic drugs, the type of drugs that are mind-altering. And if you guys have ever listened to any of my past seminars, I'm not big on mind-altering drugs because those are the kind of drugs that you see children hurting other people with. You see children who are on these type of drugs wonder how they could have ever hurt their family or killed their friends at school or, or hurt their grandparents. That's what psychotropic drugs do. So guys, this is really critical information that you do not you know, end up or your family <clears throat> on these types of medications. Also too, a 42% increase in diagnosis from 2003 to 2011. So this is just skyrocketing and it's affecting a lot of people. So moving on, we got about three kinds of ADD, and you, you probably can relate to one of these or two of these, or, or maybe you've even had it before. The inattentive type, you know, it's hard for the individual or individual to organize or finish tasks, pay attention to details, follow instructions and conversation. The person is easily distractible. So that's the non-fidgety type. That's the type that's kind of just off into a daze. You know, they just seem to be in la-la land. Then you have the type that's hyperactive or impulsive. And I, I've heard some authors describe seven different types of ADD, but I don't need to get into that much detail with this. We really want to focus on just the two or three types that are the main ones that we see in society. This person fidgets, talks a lot. This is the type that's impulsive, the type that just, you know, just tries to control conversations, that interjects when they're not supposed to, that, that wasn't being talked to, and next thing you know, they're, they're rude or they're embarrassing or they're, they're um, you know, getting into conversations where they shouldn't have been, or, or they, make, they speak inappropriately, uh, interrupt others, or, or sometimes they're even physical. They might grab somebody or, because they want that attention. And then the combination presentation, symptoms of all of the above. So you might have people at one minute, they're just quiet and shy, just kind of off in a daze, and next thing you know, they're trying to grab attention, and they're impulsive, and they're inappropriate in conversations, and so on. So we see combinations of all these. Hey, Frank, welcome on, brother. Good to see you. 
So the medical approach to this, and this is what I've been trying to say, we definitely don't want to go this route because when you go the medical route, you're setting your child up or yourself up for drugs down the road. And if you are an ADD type patient and you are an adult, you know what I'm talking about because the medications you were on become a gateway to other ones. But medicine's primary focus is to treat the symptoms of ADD. It's important and critical to realize and understand this, that the ADD medications don't somehow fix their brain. It doesn't make it work better. What it does is it masks the symptoms. So if you have a child that's too low, they're in a daze, what it does is tries to ramp their brain up. We see this with stimulants, and that's why it was very hard for me at first to understand why they would give a child some kind of speed, and many of these medications are called kitty cocaine, because for Ritalin, for example, because it acts like a speed. It's got a very similar molecular structure as cocaine does. So when you put you or your child on one of these medications, know that you're putting them on a medication that is almost identical in molecular structure as cocaine. So be aware of that, because what it does is it speeds the brain up, and it speeds it up so that the person is in the type of um, brainwave state where it actually is more conducive with learning. And we can use other things too. It doesn't have to be the drugs. You see a lot of kids on this type using things like Red Bull or monster drinks or, or, or pills that are, you know, maybe not pharmaceutical type, but pills that will speed them up. Or they might use coffee and things like that as other alternatives. So little regard for what is actually causing the ADHD. And what's dangerous about these kind of drugs is virtually every single one of them, all the top drugs used for ADD carry something called a black box warning label. So if you're on any of these, please be aware of it. Ritalin, Adderall, Focalin, Vyvanse, Concerta, Wellbutrin, uh, Lexapro, Zoloft, and Effexor. These drugs we're going to get into what a black box warning is in just a moment, but these are drugs that are so dangerous. If you look up the side effects, you would be horrified, and we're gonna go over those in just a moment. But a black box warning is the strongest warning that the FDA can issue for any medication because it's linked to suicide. In fact, many times, hey Pete, welcome on brother, glad you're here. Suicide, homicidal thoughts, severe depression, all the things you don't want because you see children on these types of medications who already are depressed and then we give them a medication and it takes them deeper into a depression but then what it causes is something called emotional blunting which means that they no longer are aware of their emotions and their feelings we see this a lot of times with these children at at columbine or other schools where they shoot up their friends and you say to yourself on video, you're watching these kids walk around like they're zombies, like they're not even aware of what they're doing. They're, they're hurting their friends and there's like no remorse. They're not scared, they're not nervous. It's because they have emotional blunting. Many of these medications are also antidepressant medications. So their number one side effect of them is suicide. And could you imagine giving your child a medication thinking you're helping them? And I, like you saw the picture, I'm a father of five. Thinking you're helping your child and then you're sitting there going, What's, what are they doing in the other room where they're so quiet? What's going on in there? And then God forbid they hurt themselves. But you get psychological dependency, so these are highly addictive, highly abusive, abnormal behavior, psychotic episodes, and withdrawal. So the dangerous thing about these medications is so many times you can't even just get off them because you have problems where you have withdrawal symptoms. So there's a very, very difficult process in getting them off. And we, we work with our patients' doctors on how to do that, but there is a way to get off of these types of medications. These are the side effects that you're typically told about. <clears throat> Unfortunately, they're a very short list, but I'm gonna show you in a moment the big list of side effects. But you have things like loss of appetite. Okay, so your doctor tells you, well, your child's gonna have loss of appetite. No big deal, you're thinking, you know? So if they're gonna behave better in school, you know what, they can lose a couple of pounds, you know? But one of the main side effects is anorexia also weight loss, sleep problems, headaches, and jitteriness. Those are the typical ones you're told about by your doctor. But how many of you guys have opened up a box of a, of a medication and seen one of those big you know, sheets like this? I just happen to have one here. And you open up one of these bad boys and you see this enormous list of things. I mean, how many of you guys have seen that kind of stuff where it's like you need like a you know, a thesaurus to figure out what some of these words mean and all because they're just so, so high tech. But that's typically what we actually see. So when we see one of those lists in here, this is what's really the side effect. So what I did is I took those top 10 or so 
and uh, uh, psychotropic medications. And what I did is I pulled all the side effects and compared the commonality in them. And so we see things once again like suicide, depression, psychosis. I mean, who wants their children to experience that? Who wants their kids to have myocardial infarction or stroke or seizures or sudden death? Can you imagine that you're giving your child a medication for, for attention deficit because they want to perform better in school and there's sudden death. I mean, can you imagine that? Are you ever told that? Here's anorexia again, dizziness, gross depression, nausea, vomiting, headaches, homicidal ideation, the thoughts of killing or hurting other people. So not only killing or hurting yourself, but homicidal thoughts. I mean, how serious is that? Tachycardia, where the child's heart is just racing and racing, they get the jitteriness, anxiety, palpitations where your heart is just pumping out of your chest, <clears throat> hallucinations, AV block, that's atrial ventricular block. The AV block is the, uh, the atrial ventricular parts of the heart that pump the blood through the heart. An AV block means that the electrical signals between those two parts of the heart aren't working anymore. They're blocked. So heart conditions and angioedema, heart swelling. I mean, are you ever told this by your doctors that your child could potentially have any of these side effects? And I didn't even read them all. You can, you can go back and watch this tape and freeze it and see all the different side effects. But this is serious stuff. If we don't get a handle on this, your children could end up on this. And what message are we then sending our children? As I said before, do you really want your child thinking that they need to be on some kind of medication in order to function? Like they're somehow defective, that they weren't made right, that God didn't make them properly, that they, but if they take this pill, then they're going to be okay. You start to set up a big problem with that. When your child then doesn't make the high school football team or the cheerleading squad or has a breakup with a boyfriend or girlfriend, then they're headed for another drug because what happens is, hey guys, reality here, we're trying to do the best we can to help raise our children. And we think we're doing the best we can when we give them medication for their little headache or tummy ache or sore throat or sinus problem or asthma or whatever it is. They look to us as their, their loving uh, caregivers and we're doing the best we can. So I'm not judging anybody, but this is what we're taught to do. Give your child a drug. And then when they don't make the cheerleading squad or the football team, they turn to drugs later on because they say, you know what, my parents said, Drugs are okay. They made me feel good. And so I'll take this little bit of sniff of this or a, a smoke of that to get through and cope because they never had to cope with things in life. And you know what? You, might, you guys might look at me as extreme with that, but I'm telling you what, it's the truth. We have created a drug-dependent society that we've got to change or we're going to be headed for bigger, bigger problems. Hey, Kurt. Glad you're on, brother. Glad to see you. And where do they get these ideas from? They get it because we're advertising everywhere. Say no to drugs. Remember, who remembers uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, Nancy Reagan's wife, saying, you know, starting that whole campaign, say no to drugs. Well, how do you say no to drugs when every channel you turn on is four out of five commercials or a drug ad or a drug commercial? Just say no to drugs. Meanwhile, the teacher's saying, did you take your Ritalin today, kids? Your Ritalin for your ADD? I mean, come on. And we wonder why kids are turning to drugs for everything. It's because that's what we're programming them for. So what are the common causes of ADD now? Well, there's a lot of different causes, and they range anywhere from things to genetics. There is a somewhat of a genetic factor. But I'm going to tell you this, guys. If any of you have seen my past seminars, you know I talk about something called epigenetics. And what epigenetics means is that there's something above your genes. Epi means above and above the genome. And what that means is this, your choices, your lifestyle, things that you do, things that you eat, your stress levels, your exercise, or if you don't, or in, in our office, we talk about whether you have a properly functioning spine and nerve system or don't. These things will cause your genes to either express one way or the other. So think of your genes like a light switch. You can have the genes for heart disease or cancer or diabetes or Alzheimer's, but if you don't do the things to turn that gene on, it will never get expressed. If you turn to do the things that we know, like our, we teach our patients to do to turn the genes off, then those genes won't be expressed. But you can conversely do the things that flip them on. So if your family has a history of ADD or diabetes or heart disease or cancer, you can turn the genes on or off. It's called epigenetics. So genetics does play a role, but it's a very small role. The bigger part is what are you doing with your child or your body? That's the bigger role. Abuse is a big thing. That creates emotional stresses to the brain. Okay? 
Brain injuries, so traumatic brain injuries, we call them TBIs. Concussions are huge now. We hear about it all the time, whether it be kids on the playground or in a football game or on TV. We're looking at these guys now where they can't hit above the chin anymore. They can't go for the head. If they go for the head, they're out of the game. So the, this idea of head hunting is gone. Low birth weight babies, premature delivery, alcohol, tobacco use during pregnancy. But here's the biggest one, guys. This is the one you never hear about because the drugs and the things that people do today typically start to work on these things. But the biggest thing that we see that is the cause, the true cause of ADHD is actually brainwave problems. Your brain works on different wave frequencies. So for example, the lowest frequency is called delta. Delta is the frequency that your brain uses when it wants to go to sleep. So think of it like first gear all the way up to fourth gear. First gear, your brain is asleep. Second gear, your brain is kind of in and out of sleep. That's kind of that twilight time where you're just starting to nod off or just waking up. You're not asleep fully, but you're also not awake either. You're out, okay? The next one up is called alpha. So we go delta, theta, alpha. Alpha, that speed, is when your, your brain is basically just chilling out, relaxing. And a lot of you guys, I know I could tell you this, I experienced it. How many times have you guys experienced where you're driving home from uh, work or anywhere else and you zone out and don't remember the whole trip, right? How many of you guys remember that? Just kind of chime in or just put yes in that, in that uh, comment bar. Yeah, we all have experienced that. You get home and you're like, I don't remember this trip. How did I get here? That's alpha, you zoned out, that's a meditative state. And then the fastest is beta. Beta is the one you want your child listening to or using, I'm sorry, when they're listening in class and alert. It's what you want to be using in a business meeting or in some kind of conference. You want to be alert in that. The problem is, is that when the brain starts to get problems shifting from gear to gear, when it's appropriate to be in a higher one, it's stuck in a lower one or vice versa, that is what we call brainwave dysregulation or in essence, your brain waves are shorting out, so your brain's not working properly. So, let's get into now, how do we build a better brain? All right, so how do we get your brain working better? So what I wanna to touch on right now, are the, some of the things you could do at home, some of the simple things you could do at home that you can start doing, and some of the things you need to stop doing that could be actually damaging your brain. Number one is understanding what the brain is made of. I mean, your brain is literally made of two things, fat and water. Some of us might have a little more fat in our heads, I won't say, but uh, <laughs> I've been called that too. But your brain is about 60% fat. And a lot of it, a lot of it is cholesterol. Guys, you need to know that because how many times are we trying to lower cholesterol in our bodies thinking we're gonna make our hearts better when reality is, number one, there's no links to that in a healthier heart. No research shows that, but number two, it also creates depression because you start pulling cholesterol out of the brain. We need cholesterol in our brains in order to function properly. So water and fatty acids are absolutely critical for proper brain function. In fact, just before I came out here, I had some coconut oil because coconut oil, as we talked about in one of my last seminars on the benefits of coconut oil, is that it breaks down into ketones and ketones are what you can fuel your brain with and it doesn't require insulin. So it's a good thing we're going to be talking about in just a moment. But clean water is a must. And when I say clean water, I'm not talking about tap water. I'm not talking about filtered water. I'm not talking about even distilled water. Distilled water is actually a very aggressive water because it's been pulled of so many nutrients. It doesn't have any minerals in it. So what it tends to do is pull minerals from your body. You don't want to use distilled water. I mean, if it's, it's a better choice than tap water and, and a better choice than, you know, filtered water, which a lot of these companies got in trouble because they were using and trying to say it was actually purified water and, and, and so on. But the best water to use is reverse osmosis. That's the one you want to use. So reverse osmosis is good. But part of the reason why you want so much water in your diet is because of this, cerebral spinal fluid. So that fluid that's inside your skull that helps to cushion your brain is made of water, of course. So cerebral spinal fluid bathes, feeds, and protects your brain and spinal cord. Cerebral spinal fluid also maintains the electrolytic environment. We all know that the reason our nerves work properly is because of um, the environment that's created through electricity. Your brain and body work and your nerve system work because of, a, of an electrical charge that flows across. It's called the sodium potassium pump. Not that you need to know that, but it's just a little FYI for you. But the electrolytic environment is maintained through the CSF 
central nervous system by cleansing metabolic waste and products from the brain and the spinal cord. So we need this water to actually cleanse our brain and cleanse our spinal cord and nerve system, which is our central nerve system or our central command system. It's almost like the fuse panel on your house. You've got to have clean water for that, for proper brain function. Also, CSF provides a medium to transport hormones and neurotransmitters. So we need these neurotransmitters and hormones for optimal function. So once again, water and fatty acids. So another thing that helps to move the fluid through your system, and a lot of us aren't doing enough of this, is physical exercise. By moving and physical movement, your muscles are actually pumping fluid up and down through your spinal cord from your brain down to your, your, kind of your tailbone area or your low back. And it's pumping that fluid, which is cleaning, bathing the spinal cord, taking away toxins, bringing nutrients, keeping that electrolyte balance going that we were just talking about. And that happens through physical exercise. The problem is so many of us don't move anymore. We're sitting at desks like this and we're not getting that pump going. So guys, definitely want to start exercising more. And fats. We talked about the fatty acids. Well, we all know that for years fats were vilified. Back ever since Eisenhower had a Big heart attack back, I think it was 1955. One of his top advisors, this guy named Ansel Keys, said, we need to get rid of fat. Fat's the culprit. Fat's what's causing your arteries to clog up. We need to get into more grains, healthy whole grains. Well, we see what's happened with that. We have more low fat than ever in our society. And we have more heart disease than ever. We have more grains in our society. And we have more diabetes also. So it's not working. So Time Magazine came out with this article just the last year where they said, eat butter. Why science was you know, mislabeled fat the enemy and why they were wrong. So now we're seeing what we have been telling our patients to do for 25 years now that I've been in practice is eat healthy quality fats. So let's get into that. Saturated fats. Oh no, I can't eat saturated fats. They're going to clog my arteries. I can't do that. Really? <laughs> Guys, breast milk. A large part of it is a saturated fat. So God intended for us to eat saturated fats but it has to be the right saturated fats. One of them is extra virgin coconut oil. It is phenomenal. And like I said, I'm not going to get too into detail with it. Go back to one of my seminars last week and see, we talked all about the benefits of coconut oil and how phenomenal it is. But grass-fed meats, once again, commercially grazed meats, the raised meats, the ones we eat that are typical, the ones you buy in a store that aren't grass-fed are felt fed grain. And we're going to talk a little while about what grain does to the body. But you want to eat grass-fed meats to, to build a healthy brain because those are your good saturated fats. And they're high in omega-3 fats. So even steak, you can get omega-3s out of it. And grass-fed butter. So whatever the cow's eating, you're getting to your system too. Alkaline forming fats, once again, alkaline meaning you're raising the pH of the body. And we've also talked about in previous seminars, when you raise the pH of the body, the cells of your body work better. That's what they're designed to do. Also, too, it helps fight cancer and prevent cancer cell growth. But extra virgin olive oil, avocados, almonds, pecans, and pumpkin seeds, all great alkaline forming uh, fats. Omega-3 fats, high quality fish oil, one of the great things we see in these cold water fishes and and salmon. And I know you're thinking, well, I can't eat fish because it has too much mercury. Well, come on. <laughs> There's not that much mercury in a fish, but if you're that concerned about it, eat salmon like sockeye salmon. Sockeye salmon has virtually no teeth or they're tiny little teeth. They don't eat other fish to get that mercury buildup. So use sockeye salmon. Krill oil, wild fish, flax oil, flax seeds, hemp seeds, chia seeds, which are phenomenal. I put this in almost all my smoothies. Pumpkin seeds and walnuts. I mean, I eat, I've got all kinds of different snack foods, and they're typically cashews, almonds, walnuts, all kinds of nuts that, uh, that I snack on because of their great omega-3 properties. You want to make sure they're not blanched or roasted, though. They need to be raw. It's going to be better for you. All right, more brain food. Brain food needs antioxidants because of free radical attack. Well, what are the best antioxidants? Well, if anybody wants this information, you could also email me at live at drsudano.com. I'll give you this information at the end again, so you don't have to write it down now, but you want to get this information. You want to get a top list of what we call ANDI score foods. And an ANDI score means this, aggregate nutrient density index. Aggregate nutrient density index, or ANDI, are the foods that are the most nutrient dense per calorie. 
Okay? The most nutrient-dense foods. And the rock stars are things like collard greens, Swiss chard, kale, spinach. Um, those are your rock stars. They've got the highest Andy score. In fact, collard greens and kale are about 1,000. That's the highest you can go. So you want to get in great, great, really dense, rich, dark green foods. Hey, Thelma. Good to see you. Glad you're on today. The other thing you want to do, too, is eat berries. Berries have tons and tons of color, lots of bioflavonoids, so berries are phenomenal. We're talking about strawberries, blackberries, raspberries, all your berries. Much lower glycemic index than the other kinds of food, uh, fruits, so it's even better for you that. It doesn't spike your insulin levels, so lots of berries. The bioflavonoids in the berries are great, great antioxidants. And vitamin E, so you want to make sure you get a natural raw source of vitamin E. So those are the top things that we can do when it comes to giving our bodies the right antioxidants. Now, glutathione. Now, glutathione, for those of you who don't know what that is, that is the mother of all antioxidants that our body has in it. So this is the one that is the, the, the like I said, the mother of them all. This is the one that's the most important. This one, I get a lot from grass-fed whey protein powder. So you want to get this, get a good quality grass-fed whey, that's non-denatured, has very few ingredients in it, and so that way you're getting the best quality glutathione because a lot of these protein powders that you get today, they might be uh, you know, uh, whey protein, but they're typically commercially made and they're made as a whey protein isolate. You want to concentrate. So once again, whey protein concentrate, grass-fed, non-denatured, very few ingredients in it because you want to make sure the glutathione is intact, but is it a super, super antioxidant and you absolutely need it for your body. It's the number one in your body. You could also get it from grass-fed cheese, organic eggs. I get people all the time saying to me, I can't eat eggs, too much cholesterol. Eat eggs, eat a lot of eggs. Eggs are phenomenal. I eat anywhere, and this blows people away. I may, might eat anywhere from three to 12 eggs a day. It just depends what kind of mood I'm in. If I get home late from a seminar and I just want to make an omelet, I'm just gonna have eggs for that. I might have eggs for lunch and eggs for breakfast, and usually I eat about four at the same time, so I get a lot of eggs. So just a ton. Let's see, any questions? All right, avocado, spinach, and asparagus, also great sources of glutathione. Now, coming into the home stretch, what do we want to avoid, huh? What do you think of those special effects? Huh? Pretty good, it's like, kind of like Spielberg. What do we want to avoid? Well, we want to avoid things that create inflammation in the body. And what we're finding out through inflammation right now, and this has been going on for about the past decade or so, more and more research is coming in showing that inflammation, now I'm not talking about inflammation of a, of a sinus issue or you twisted your ankle or something like that. That's a, a local inflammation. I'm talking about a systemic inflammation where it's all over your body, where it's virtually everywhere, and certain foods will create that. Number one, that will create inflammation is wheat. Okay, wheat is a super starch. It has something in it called amylopectin A, and it is a mega starch, and it creates massive inflammation in your body. A lot of you guys know that because you may be, you know, glut uh, gluten intolerant. Even if you're not gluten intolerant, you still may have adverse reactions when it comes to wheat. You still might feel bloated. You might not necessarily go into a full-blown reaction to it, but you still might feel sluggish, have some brain fog or just you know, achy joints. I had a patient years ago who was always coming in crying. I mean, he, he literally, his name was Ed. He would, he's, he's like, Dr. Nick, I was, I was in the barber chair today in tears. My, my rheumatoid is acting up. I said, Ed, you need to get off of the wheat products. And he kept you know, going on and on, especially after he ate chocolate chip cookies. He would come in and say, my hands are killing me. I don't know what to do, what do I do? And he was taking a drug called Remicade that was an extremely expensive, expensive drug. And I said, Ed, you gotta get off the wheat. He wasn't listening, but guess what? He came in one day and he said, hey, Dr. Nick, I read a book called Wheat Belly and I found out that wheat's my problem. I was like, well, okay, great. I'm glad you came up with that idea all on your own. But he started getting off the wheat and his swelling started coming down. So guys, if you know of anybody who's got, you know, rheumatoid arthritis and so on, get him off the wheat. Skin conditions, get him off the wheat. That's a whole nother seminar we'll do on skin conditions and so on like eczema. But you'll always see stuff coming to the outside. So you want to get off wheat, corn, Corn, 99% of the corn is GMO, so it's genetically modified. Your body doesn't even really know what to do with it. And soy. Soy is, is basically like a, an anti-estrogen. I mean, soy, or like, like estrogen, I should say. So you don't want to be taking too many soy products because 
it actually mimics estrogen. So a lot of people say, but what about the Asians? Asians eat a lot of soy and they have low rates of cancer. It's very different. They use different types of soy. Their soy many times is fermented, so it's very different. The type of soy we're using right now, it's just cheap protein. Soybeans are really cheap. We use a lot of it and we can put it in anything. It can be disguised as anything. So it tends to be in our diet a lot, but soy is not very good for you. Commercial dairy also, lots of antibiotics, hormones, bovine growth hormone. Um, different uh, uh, steroids. So we're getting so much stuff in our, um, in our dairy products that isn't healthy for us. So commercial dairy. And, uh, you know, and people say to me, well, Dr. Nick, does that mean you never eat ice cream? Well, I, I have it, of course, from time to time. But you know what? People just consume so much of this stuff. That's the problem. When it's a major part of your diet is when it's the issue. Commercial meats, we talked about that earlier. Your commercial meats are raised where they're eating what? These grains. They're eating those grains so you're eating what they ate. Because when farmers want to fatten up cows, they don't give them fat, guys. They give them grains. And the grains will fatten up the cows. And next thing you know, you know they're ready for, for market. But now we're eating what they ate. So if we're eating commercial meats, the problem when you give them grains is you spike the omega-6 ratio and you lower the omega-3 ratio. Omega-6, guys, is extremely inflammatory and omega-3 is anti-inflammatory. So we want to change that. We want more omega-3s and less omega-6. It's typically a one-to-one -one ratio or a one-to-four ratio with omega-6 being the four. That's okay. But the problem is right now, because of our commercially raised meats, it's almost like one to 20 to one to 30, which is way out of line. So we can't be using that. So get off the commercially raised meats, go to grass-fed meat. Or bison. Bison's another great one. I eat a lot of bison or if you can get deer, things like that. But bison's a great one because bison's kind of smart. They're not stupid like cows. They don't eat grains. They eat grass like they're supposed to. Refined carbohydrates, these are almost like faux foods. I mean, it's like Franken food. These things aren't even really food anymore. Your processed refined carbohydrates, we all know it because we all say they're empty calories, and that's the truth. There is no nutritional value to a lot of these carbohydrates, and in fact, they're anti-nutrients. They could actually take nutrients from your body. So refined carbohydrates. And last but not least, wow, all your packets of color stuff, your NutraSweet, your, your Splenda, your, all your pink stuff, blue stuff, and yellow stuff, all these artificial sweeteners, colors and preservatives are major, major causes of brain issues. So I would see my son many times, he'd come back from a friend's house and be sitting there and just kind of you know, uh, acting up, just, you know, almost nasty, almost mean. And we're thinking, what did you have? Where did you go? And sure enough, if he went over to a friend's house and they had something with NutraSweet in it, the blue packet, which is typically in, you know, certain lemonades or certain, you know, colorful drink products, that's where he would get it from. Or it was even the red dye in it. He'd come back from these places just, just angry. And a lot of times it was because of that. So you want to stay away from any artificial dyes, colorings, preservatives, sweeteners. Everything here. These artificial sweeteners, guys, cause brain seizures and brain tumors. They won't even let pilots fly when they use this kind of stuff because the risk of a seizure while they're in the cockpit is too high. So you've got to stay away from this kind of stuff. All these things here are actually, once again, detrimental to your brain. So you want to up the other things we talked about, the berries, the, the high Andy score foods, vitamin E and so on, your healthy quality fats. After all, guys, like I said, your brain is 60% fat. You have to increase fat in you or your child's brain. Get them on butter. We've been avoiding butter for years using margarine. Meanwhile, margarine is the worst. It converts to trans fats like that. Butter does not. So you want to stick with butter. Get away from the margarine and things like that or these shed spreads and these, you know, all these artificial spreads. You want to avoid it. So next time, I want you guys to watch out for it. Next time we're going to talk. And like I said, it'll probably be tomorrow at this exact same time. We're going to dive deeper into this because we're going to get into the number one strategy. This other stuff are things you can do at home. But the number one strategy that we're going to talk about for reversing and healing ADD, that is a must. You want to see that one and make sure that you tune in tomorrow. Or I hope you don't miss it, but you could also watch it later on in a video. But I hope you're there live for it. It's always better live knowing you guys are there. So once again, I said earlier, if you like what you see, guys, and you like what you've heard, you know, give us a thumbs up, give us the heart, but more importantly, share it. You've got to share this information out. Hopefully it was valuable, you saw value in it, but you've got to get it out to people because I know there's people out there, your friends, your family members, people across the country or in other parts of the world 
<clears throat> who need to know this information and they could actually benefit by it. So please share it out to people. And also too, guys, follow us. You know, click that, there's a little follow button. You can follow and you'll get notifications as to when I go on the air. And also too, last but not least, comment. Leave us comments. Let me know what you liked. Let me know what you didn't like. You know, I'm all about conversation. I like conversation with our, our viewers. Let me know what you want to hear about. There may be a topic that I didn't bring up that you want to know about, or it's kind of, you know, a health struggle you've got. Let me know, and we'll do a seminar on that. So, guys, I love you. I appreciate you. I thank you for being here today. Once again, if you want any other information about our office, just email me at live at drsudano.com live at drsedano.com and I'll get your questions answered for you. So once again, guys, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Love and appreciate you. And uh, keep tuning in. Let's make this effort a team effort and uh, giving you the voice of truth and making the complicated health issues hopefully very simple for you. So I appreciate you guys. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you soon. God bless. Bye-bye.